Hello, my name is Jonathan Stalin. I'm the curator of the Chinese Literature Translation Archive here at the University of Oklahoma. I have the great pleasure of introducing our guest today, David Hinton, poet, translator, tr translated the works of the Tao Te Ching, Confucius, Mencius, uh, classical poets like Li Bai and Du Fu, uh, as well as Xie Ling Yun and other poets that he really is responsible for introducing to a broader American audience, as well as contemporary poets like Bei Dao, and, uh, and his, himself a poet, uh, published multiple volumes of poetry. And today I really want to talk about the relationship of translation and poetry in your work and in the world more generally. So um, to get there, let's start with uh, what came first, Chinese or poetry? Okay. Uh, it was definitely poetry. Um, I was a poet um, operating out of a kind of West Coast framework, which is pretty influenced by ancient Chinese, and also very interested in Taoism and Chan Buddhism or Zen Buddhism. Um, and then after getting an MFA as a poet, I um, was just reading around and, um, and I, was, I read numerous times within a week for some reason, I don't know why, I just happened to read that Du Fu was the greatest poet in human history or of Chinese history or various things like that. So I was living in New York and I went to the New York Public Library where I tried to read all the Dufu I could in English and I wasn't convinced he was a, a particularly special poet. And then, but then I found a book that takes Chinese, or takes uh, 30 of Dufu's poems and for each poem you can look at the Chinese and then word for word translations, line for line, and then prose translations. Do you remember what That's the what little, book that was? Um, David Hawke's uh, Little Primer of Dufu. And um, so I could, and I spontaneously started translating them um, because I could translate almost as if I could read Chinese because I had all those steps sitting there. And I just realized that there was so much to do that it wasn't being done. So much, to, so much in, a, in one of those poems that wasn't being translated. And so I spent a month or two there in the library basically from the doors open until the doors closed translating and then I went back to Cornell which, which has a, very, a super intense uh, Chinese language program. And then I, then I started translating Dufu, and that was my first book a few years after that. And it turns out, we were just talking earlier, that you're returning to that work uh, to yeah, rework some of yeah, that. Yeah, because I, I, I only slowly realized how much the ancient sort of Taoist, Chan Buddhist conceptual framework operates in Chinese poems, and that's what I'm most interested in now, even more than sort of the surface of the poem, the sort of uh, dramatic or narrative surface. Um, and I didn't know how to shape books with that framework in, built into them, which I learned how to do a little later. So I went back the last year and retranslated Du Fu, expanded it quite a bit, and 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 packaged it with that whole framework in it. And then simultaneously, next year will be translated a book of essays about, that talk about about 20 Dufu poems. Um, shows the Chinese, shows the English translation, and then an essay about what isn't in, you can't, that you sort of can't translate. That is the whole Taoist, Chan Buddhist conceptual framework, and also the really radically fundamentally different way that the Chinese language works. And that, and Chinese poetry really um, exploits that, the, the characteristics of Chinese language to make them almost part of the poem. Um, and just like briefly, it's like the classical Chinese poetic language is super stripped down. It's very, very minimalist. Uh, so all the words resonate and there's, and they operate in a kind of atmospheric of emptiness can that you, you can't really do in, in English. Yeah, can you, um, I mean, Dufu is, would not, in the Chinese tradition, be thought of as a, as a Chan or Taoist yeah. poet. And yet, you're talking about the forms within which he wrote, of course, are born in this nexus of Confucianism and Taoism and Buddhism mm -hmm. and are an aesthetic uh, emergent property of these of these conceptual systems as you're as you're mm -hmm. talking about. So how do you um, uh, in your work how do you balance I guess you know how much to convey 
of the general system, the general poetics within which Dufu is operating, and some of the specificity about his work that might be a little bit more Confucian, for instance, than Buddha Taoism, or, yeah. or is that something you worry about? Uh, how do you well, reconcile the specificity of a poet in the, in the broad general brushes right. of the whole system, right, which is also untranslatable or infinitely open and interesting to talk about? Yeah, that's what's interesting about Dufu is because he's not usually considered a Chan yeah. a poet or a Taoist poet. He's usually paired with Li Bo as the two great poets, and they were contemporaries and friends. And Li Bo is sort of the Taoist, uh, um, kind of spontaneous and wild, and Dufu is the Confucian, who's much more concerned with society, and his poems, or a lot of his poems are about the social situation, the huge civil war going on. But the thing about, that's so, that's interesting about Dufu is that what structures his poems is still this Taoist, Chan Buddhist cosmology and ontology. And it's interesting to show how that works in a poet that you don't think of as a Taoist or Chan poet. Um, and also I can follow it, He's, his biography is very interesting, so I can follow these, this, these ideas through his life. Early on he was a more, very, very early, he was a much more sort of Chan Taoist poet more explicitly. Later on, he's much more of a social poet. However, there's always built in and structuring a social vision is this Taoist and Chan framework. Is that an answer? I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and you know from. And that's true. I, sorry, that that's also true of even Confu even the Analects. When I translated that, I realized and I wrote about in the introduction that people think about Confucianism, the Analects say in the Tao Te Ching, Confucianism and Taoism as radically separate, but in fact, the whole Confucian worldview is built on that Taoist cosmology and ontology. Yeah, and of and course, the Tao is what Confucius is writing about the path, and you know, the conceptions yeah, may be use distinct, that word, right. but you know, but, but... And Chan uses the word too, and, yeah. and people forget that when Chan texts use that word, they usually want to just read it in a kind of Buddhist context, the way that people want to read that were in the Analects in a purely Confucian. But if you actually look how the word's working, it's usually working you know, the same way it works in, in the Tao Te Ching. Yeah, so they're all Taoisms, different kinds of isms, perhaps, and they're related I to think one they're another, all, but they all well, I think they're all the built path, on yeah. the framework that, it's, that Lao Tzu describes. The others don't describe it, they assume it. Confucius or, da or Dufu, they assume that framework, and then they operate. Louds and louds and you know a little bit less less so, uh, Zhuangzi or the Yijing are more explicitly about describing how that that framework. So presumably the young David Hinton's in that library looking at these interlinear 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 translations of the poems and and discovering some of these concepts of Taoism and and that feeling of discovery that they're not in fact fully. Uh, uh, emergent in the translations that they are still uncovered, actually, mm -hmm. and that you can participate in the uncovering. Yeah. I'm imagining that at that time you start to think about your agency as a poet as being both a creator, but also something of a of a mediator or of you know a conduit of concepts into the English language and to your readers. You know, when did you start thinking about your work uh, as a translator as being you know as moving concepts from the three teachings from Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, and to the English language. Who were your, who was the, who did you conceive of as your contemporaries? You know, Rex Roth and Snyder, uh, Pound and Finelos is coming earlier than you. You know, but w I'm just curious when this all galvanized and you kind mm -hmm. of f felt like, yeah, this is my practice and this is, this is. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. At the beginning, I was just a poet translating poetry. Then uh, slowly it became, and maybe it went, it's when I started translating the philosophy books, uh, Anal Analex and Tao Te Ching and Zhuangzi and Mencius. And when did that start in relationship to that Dufu book? Um, the, the, the probably 15 years later. Yeah, that's what I thought. But I started seeing it also in um, Tao Chen a little bit. Um, I don't remember exactly when, but I started realizing that there are these, you know, this whole philosophical world is embedded in the poetry, or assumed by the poetry, or shapes the poetry, and even shapes the language of the po of poetry. Um, 
Um, but I don't remember when exactly that was. Uh, but I did. But I did more and more think of myself as translating a culture, or, or my translation as a cultural project in English or in, Amer in a, uh, the U.S. or the West. And and the project was a kind of extension of. In the fifties, the beginning of. Uh, sort of the arrival of Zen Buddhism and you know, Suzuki and um, this, Im this import, what's the word, this, this um, migration of, the, of this Chinese worldview began, well really with Pan and Fenelosa for our culture, but then it began really in earnest in the 50s when Zen became a thing um, and it started shaping the arts, uh, John Cage and all of that. Uh, Did you find that you were coming into to these tributaries as, a, as another tributary into a, into this kind of cultural flow mm -hmm. uh, migration of trans-Pacific ideas um, or, or did you have a feeling of of, uh, of a corrective at some level or of you know what how did how do you think about your work in relationship to the previous generation of mm -hmm. translators and and I wonder if this is I'm sure this has evolved over your career but I I'm guessing that it's when you started translating the classics, the, the philosophy, that you might have gained some purchase on what wasn't being translated, mm -hmm. right, in the, in the earlier I think it, generations. I think, it, I think it was then, but I'm just thinking some of the poetry books before then I had started doing it. I think Sia Lingyuan, I definitely was doing it, but it, maybe that was in the middle of those, because those philosophy translations spread out over some years. Um, but let's see. Uh, what was your question? The, the, but no, I'm the, curious the about like you know like like did you uh, chafe at all? Uh, at, oh, oh at, yeah, with the, earlier with Rex right, right. or Snyder translations um, and, and yeah, I uh, yeah, I do think of I do think of myself and one of the things I'm trying to do is get Chinese that Chinese cultural framework on its own terms, and I think mostly in before me the tr translators haven't been doing that. They've been imposing Western uh, ideas on it. Just to give one example, there's this term Ziran, which means, uh, um, well, I have to describe old cosmology, but it means things emerging into existence. That's what it means. And that is has been translated as nature in, the, uh, in, in most translations, um, because it is, the place that Zeron is most apparent is in the sort of quote unquote natural world where things are selfless. They just appear of their own nature and live their lives and then disappear. That's Zeron. And then aspiration is to live your life as Zeron. Um, but when it's translated, but then it became translated as, it's always been translated as nature. Um, and nature, not well, first, it's kind of wrong, but it imposes Western metaphysics because the word nature, by definition, means everything not human. But the whole idea in ancient China was to integrate human consciousness with everything else. Um, so nature kind of um, violates that Taoist um, conceptual framework. And it imposes Western metaphysics into it, and you don't even notice it because it's just a word, and it's the definition of the word that, that does that. And that's like that comes up at the end of a very famous Tao Chen poem, where he says he was working as a government official, and he went and he quit and he went home to his farm. <clears throat> and at the end of this long poem, he says, "And I went back to, I after after all those years in the in this trap. I think he used the word." I return to, and then in all the English translations, nature. So it sounds like this pretty kind of postcard. I went back to the pretty countryside, but the word isn't nature; it's Zeron. So he return. What he returns to is this immediate experience of this whole cosmological process. Mm -hmm. and that's like a whole different uh, poem, a whole yeah, different it's, world. It's not Wordsworth. Yeah. It's, yeah. Exactly. It's totally not Wordsworth. Yeah. Right. And of course, that's that's been an interesting confluence of, oh, look, you know, English Romanticism and Chinese 
uh, poetic tradition and have all of these mm. kind of rel relatedness, yeah, but on you know, the but surface, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it, it's both a mistake. It can be generative, and mm. you know, in imagining um, eco poetics coming out of reverence for nature in the sense that we might imagine it. Um, but mm -hmm. what I think is interesting about you is that you translate both philosophy and poetry, and so uh, you pre-answered a question I was going to ask later on, which is, you know, what is the difference between the two? I would imagine that the, the philosophy translator has to pay a lot of attention to these kinds of issues because um, philosophy is about concepts and mm -hmm. translating a concept means probably reinventing language, mm -hmm. introducing borrowisms and, and neologisms and, you know, in order to convey a, a new paradigm or a different right. conceptual system. Poetry you know, may not have that same burden or some people might not imagine it, uh -huh. it does, but I'm getting a sense that you that you see not a real binary between poetry and philosophy, you, you would suggest that the translator has the same responsibility for breaking um, epistemological a priori assumptions of the English reader and, and requiring a new language mm -hmm. to convey the system behind the poem, you know, within the poem, as the poem of the poem, and so on. So I don't think you do make a distinction, but that's my question. How do you how do you tackle the two? Yeah, um, there is a lot of philosophy in Chinese poetry, and they use philosophical terms like ziran. Uh, and then, so yeah, I have to invent terms to render them in a way that makes them not just sound like another version of some Western idea, because they're not. They're usually radically different, even if they sound a little bit like nature in that case. Um, and in philosophy, the philosophy books. Yeah, then that becomes a big thing. And I was totally amazed. I thought when I started translating the classics that what I was going to do was make them more literary in English, make them read better. But I discovered that no translation, even scholarly translations, had ever consistently translated the key philosophical terms. Even in the same paragraph, they were translated differently. And I was just stunned, mm -hmm. because you can't read these things if you don't even know these really, you know, there are 10, 5, 10, 15, 20, depending on, you know, where you're looking, really key terms. And if you get the terms right, you can almost describe the whole philosophical system. Now, I even do that in the back of a lot of books, the key terms section. Yeah. Um, well, those terms like Tao or like Zeran or like, um, there are three or four or five Confucian terms. So they're translated, they should be translated the same. They need to be translated the same, or at least versions of the same word, like humanity and humane or something like that. Uh, they, um, but they weren't. They were, so, so, th so that was one of the things I did with those translations. And across all five of the, cla of the philosophy translations, I've translated all the terms consistently so people can track ideas. Into through different do you, contexts. Do you think there's there. hope for introducing concepts like qi, which is relatively stable as a Chinese word in mm -hmm. the English language? Do you think that eventually we will just be able to say ziran, wu wei, li, mm -hmm. wei? Well, you can do that with so dao and qi now. Yeah, and so make people do you think have a little we'll bit get of an there? Idea. Like these, the, the gradually, yeah, the maybe. English language will will assimilate these terms and yeah. allow for the really complex significations that undergird them to be right to be there I mean, but even I was going to say even the even getting the words right isn't necessarily enough so I have to write intro, in the introductions I sort of talk about all this stuff and I put the key term section in the back and, and yeah and, um, yeah I like that idea you know I mean yeah. some people might object to the notion of a key terms because it's like that's a lot of architecture for a poetry book yeah but I yeah, think yeah, it's yeah necessary but last question I want you to talk a little bit about the uh, um, your poetry and this new project of kind of looking at the the relationship between American poetry and, and Chinese translation of Chinese classical poetry. Oh yeah. As a, as a poet, can you can you kind of wrap us into to the relationship of these two as a creative writer? Where does the Chinese classical poetic tradition and philosophy tradition intersect with your work? It's, that's pretty much transformed how my mind works. Um, and so that comes out in the poems. Uh, and, and then you're also asking about sort of the, the connection of ancient Chinese to modern American. And for me, that's always been, I've always taken that for granted, um, the whole transmission of Chinese culture into um, 
20th century American poetry via Pound and Fenelosa and then the people I knew, I knew more or was more influenced by at the, at the beginning, um, uh, Snyder and Rex Roth. Um, and just the whole Buddhist, you know, thing with uh, Ginsburg and that was just, seemed to me the, the assumption going forward about poetry. Um, and then, as I said, I sort of gradually wanted to, to dig into that in a more rigorous way um, than you sort of get by reading those people. In your, so in, in your own creative work, you would apply this notion of rigor a bit um, mm -hmm. because presumably you know, your contact points are far more extensive than most of the people that you were talking about who did not translate the four classics and so on right. that you've done. Like that, that is uh, your proximity to these discourses is, you know, mm -hmm. is closer than most. Is that what you mean or is there something... Something else yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's just that it's slowly I've I have um, developed a pretty deep uh, understanding, I guess, of that of, the, of the, that ancient worldview, or, which it feels to me totally contemporary too. Um, and and then what? Yeah, because I don't I don't want to write like um, what sort of contemporary Chinese poems or like Chinese poems for, for today or something like that. I don't want to do something radically different. So that's why Fossil Sky was a big map poem on a sheet, five foot square sheet. And um, and Desert, the newest book is, um, it feels like it's the Chinese worldview, but they don't feel like Chinese poems. They are very short. There's an awful lot of emptiness in them that comes from the Chinese language and, Chinese and Chan Buddhism. And then books to come or other experimental things that somehow use those, those basic ideas of um, uh, that um, sort of self, I don't know, selfless immediacy is really fundamental to, to deep living. One of the uh, things that I always appreciate the most about these different hats that you wear and the way that you integrate them is because, you know, many, many, I think many people in China today look out at the world and, and they actually don't recognize that the world has received or been influenced deeply by its culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so mm -hmm. there's a there's a concerted efforts to push Chinese culture and, and actually I think the biggest effort should be to just communicate how much, how deep and wide these impacts in fact have been in American art world and poetry world. Um, precisely because of the way in which these ideas become a form of becoming human, you know, uh, cultivating the self, like <clears throat> living a good life, um, and, and because they're so contemporary, they you know, they just they just resonate for people now remarkably. Because this stuff is like uh, Dao Jing is twenty whatever twenty six hundred years old. Yeah, and the second and most translated work into English. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I actually think it's the most. I can't believe there's a, the Bible is translated every year. And that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. It's translated every yeah, year. Yeah. Pretty reliably, a new translation comes out. Yeah, that's remarkable. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really okay. appreciate this conversation. Thanks for having me. And yeah. uh, we'll see you next time. Okay. <laughs>